Let's go ahead and pray, and then maybe Peter will be here. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and delighted to be able to gather in your house this Lord's Day evening as men of the church, men who have sensed the call to gather together and to lean into a greater understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God, what it means to be made man, what it means to bear that image in the world, what it means to serve, what it means to um, exercise power and authority, what it means to love, what it means to be a blessing. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with us tonight as we give our attention to you and as we desire to grow uh, as a people of God, as men and as the men of Beverly Heights Church. We invite your presence here and ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless us in order that we might grow. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Get your music on your way in. So... uh, Let's begin with uh, a song. I sent this to you in the email, Rise Up, O Men of God, written actually by a Presbyterian pastor in the uh, mid-1800s. It is, um, I think, uh, it's named as a festal song. You see at the bottom of your paper, but I think it's a call to arms. And a, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a march, too, which I enjoy. It's a call to arms for men to be the men that God has called us to be. Um, why is there an asterisk over the word and men, ye saints? No, we're not going to substitute that. We're going to say, rise up, O men. The text, rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> where's the uh, where's the costume store at Andrew get over there we're not doing this you missed it yeah get over there because I said so. <laughs> Gentlemen, how are you? Get your music. <clears throat> Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. You've heard me talk about uh, with, um, over, over the years this idea of a hierarchy of goods and how people's lives don't come to ruin because they're seeking evil things. Nobody does that. That's irrational. Nobody puts their hand in the fire because they think that's a good idea. That's an, that would be a dumb and evil thing to do. People's lives come to ruin because they seek lesser goods, lesser things. And the call of God upon our lives as men is to rise up and have done with lesser things, to quit being caught up by the things of this world, to be caught up by the things of the flesh, to be caught up uh, in the things that uh, seek our attention and curry our favor and elicit our desires. God is saying to the men of the church, be done with that. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the king of kings. Why do we serve the king of kings? Because there is none greater. He is God. Rise up, O men of God. The kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O men of God. The church for you doth wait Her strength unequaled to her task, rise up and make her great. There is no greatness without you. There's no greatness in the church. I truly believe it was uh, John Michaelak, your wife said to me just this past week, I feel like Beverly Heights Church is a church that's on the verge of greatness. My heart soared when she said that because I believe that's true too. And it won't be great without men, being men, Serving Christ, being the image of God that God has called us to be in this place, advancing the kingdom, not retreating, but being the men that God has called us to be, to make the church great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod, as brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God. We have a calling in our lives to follow after Christ. It is a good and high and glorious call. And so we're going to sing 
this hymn together. Why are we going to sing? A couple reasons. Let me share with you. First, a number of years ago, we hosted the Presbytery of the Alleghenies, which is our presbytery in the EPC. We hosted a presbytery meeting in this sanctuary, and it was filled pretty, it was close to capacity. I would say uh, double what we have here plus 10% more. Mostly men. Some, some women were here, but mostly men. And we sang the hymns of the faith, and this place roared. It was moving. Uh, I remember uh, sensing it, acknowledging it, and uh, Alyssa said the same thing to me afterwards. She couldn't believe what we were hearing. I used to think that this uh, space, I mean, I knew better. You can hear the, the reverberation and the echo uh, in the room. But I used to think that perhaps this space just sucks the sound out, and that's why uh, we're not heard. Maybe it's because I'm usually up here and the organ is loud, and it's not always easy for me uh, to sing, but it's also possible that we're just not singing, and we need to sing. We need to fill God's house with his praise and his glory. We need to sing because it glorifies God. Second of all, we need to sing because we have leadership responsibilities. God has called us to be leaders. That's what it means to be men. And to lead in the home and to lead in the church, to lead the kids, to lead our wives. And I know that not all of us are gifted vocally. I couldn't hold uh, a tune in a bucket when I was in college before I met my wife. And I still don't think I'm that good of a singer. But I've worked hard at it, and I think I'm passable. I'm at least better than Kevin. I know that much. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Yeah, it's tough. It's... yeah. Yeah, we can learn. We can learn to be singers. And we must learn to sing because we have a responsibility to lead. God has... Uh, place that burden on us as men to be leaders. And so I want us every week uh, as we gather for the next three weeks to provide or to practice in our leadership in order that we might, as men, be leaders in the church, be leaders in the home, because I want us to sing out. Not only that, as uh, Stephen had uh, cryptically alluded to, this is uh, a coy way of just getting you all into a particular choral leadership. On November 20th, we are hosting the, uh, the Night of Worship. Uh, Songs in the Night is what we've titled it. We did this a few years ago before COVID. Uh, you might remember it. It was called, uh, what was the name of it then? Do you remember? Night of, Night of Praise and Worship, I think it was. Uh, we're returning with that format November 20th. So it's the fourth Sunday after today. We've got three Sundays together, and then the fourth Sunday is the Night of Worship. And since we're already going to be in the practice of coming here at 6.30, it's not going to be that difficult to extend our time together as men one more Sunday. And I'd like us men to open up the worship time together as leaders by singing this hymn opening up our, um, our worship service. So we're going to practice for three weeks, and then we're going to just stand up here, and we're going to sing our hearts out. And we're not going to sing in parts unless you want to. I can't stop David. He's going to do it no matter what. And uh, we're going to sing, and we're going to demonstrate leadership. It's a good thing for us. And it's a good thing for others to see us do it. What's that? Three Sundays from today. Yeah, so... so This is the first of three, and then November 20th is the fourth Sunday. Finally, we need to sing because singing binds us together. There's something about singing that God has ordained to use to bind men together, to bind our hearts together. When when armies are marching, even to this day, uh, when you're in a boot camp, you'll still do that, I don't know, but I've been told nonsense. And you do it to keep time, but you do it also because it bonds you. It bonds you to your fellow man. It bonds you to your brother. It's hard to hate somebody that you sing with. And it's a lot easier to serve someone and to sacrifice for someone with whom you are singing, with whom you have shared in music something that God has made, that you share in that together. It binds your hearts to one another. 
And so I want us to, uh, to sing this song, Rise Up, O Men of God. Chad has uh, agreed to teach it to us, and after he teaches it to us, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And I've asked, um, I've asked uh, Joe back here, Mr. Mustache, to uh, lead us uh, from the organ. down. Thank you. If you could lower the lights, Bob, take a look at the screen.
Tabernacle, their annual conference, 2004, I believe, filled with young men who are preparing for their two-year mission after graduating high school. I think it's high school. They are men who have uh, heard a call. They've co-opted this song. It's in their hymnal. It was written by a Presbyterian pastor, but it is sung uh, almost every year at that national conference. If you go online, you can see the version of this sung uh, almost every year by the young men at the national conference as they are preparing to go out into the world to live with integrity and to live faithfully and boldly uh, for their faith. And uh, I look at that, and I'm both inspired, and I'm envious. Envious. There was a book written a number of years ago by a woman by the name of Kenda Creasy-Dean. She's a professor of youth ministry, actually, at Yale University. And she wrote a book called Almost Christian, what the faith of our teenagers is telling the American church. And the third chapter of that book is called Mormon Envy. And she talks about how nobody, nobody comes close to uh, the Mormons when it comes to passing on the faith to the next generation. They know how to ra- uh, raise up young men. They know how to raise up young women. All four years, all four years of high school, Every morning before they go to uh, school, uh, public school or whatever school they're going to, they spend an hour and a half to two hours in what is called seminary every day, five days a week. they got to get up and out the door by 5.30 so they can spend an hour and a half learning the faith. And it seems like a lot, but I don't know if you saw what I saw in the uh, video. There was a lot of men who seemed happy to be there. A lot of men who, uh, young men who believe in what they're singing and believe in what they're doing. Mormons are better than almost every other demographic in passing on their faith to the next generation, including evangelicals. Uh, Roman Catholics who have a very clear and well-developed um, catechism uh, program are far behind, far behind from where the Mormons are in raising up young men. And this is what uh, Kenda Creasy Dean says in her chapter on Mormon envy. Religious formation involves teaching young people how to use religious tools in the ways that are distinctive to that community, thereby establishing young people as members who belong to a particular faith tradition. Highly devoted young people seem adept at using at least four cultural tools in ways that mark them as members of their tradition. So the Mormons have identified four tools and have used these four tools with great effect in order to raise up young men, in order to raise up the next generation for uh, their faith. Those four tools include, number one, they confess their tradition's creed. They know it. They own it. They confess it. It's in part why I've been bringing back the recitation of um, the Apostles' Creed more regularly on Wednesday nights and here in a worship service. And I know that it can seem perfunctory, and I know that it can seem like it becomes rote, but do not underestimate the formational power of something like that to make you the kind of person fit for and commensurate with a way of life. The, the, if, you're, if you're curious as to whether or not that really happens, well, as Tom O'Boyle likes to say, we've run the experiment. The Mormons have shown it works. It works. They use the cultural tools to mark their members with uh, the aspects of their tradition. Number one, they confess their tradition's creed. Or God's story. Number two, they belong to a community that enacts the God story. Church isn't a place that they visit. A church is a place that they live. Their primary affections are uh, are at the local level at the church. I was listening to a 
I was listening to a uh, lecture by a gentleman by the name of Aaron Wren, who uh, has published in First Things Magazine, and he was talking about strategies for the church in the future. He was the guy who wrote about uh, the distinction between what he called positive world, neutral world, negative world. If you haven't read Aaron Wren's article on that in First Things, I would commend it to you. But he said, you know, from the 1960s until about the mid-1990s, we lived in positive world where uh, the culture had a positive conception of the church. And then from about 1994, 1995 until 2016 and the election of uh, Donald Trump, we lived in neutral world. The church and faith was not seen as uh, either positive or negative. It was if you went to church, well, that's nice. That's, That's a nice hobby that you have. But since the election of Trump, what Wren is uh, articulating is that uh, the world has changed and we've gone from positive world to neutral world to negative world. And now if you are a confessing Christian, you're a bigot. You're, You're a hateful person. You're a science denier. You're whatever it is that you are, but you're not a good thing. And so if that is the world in which we live, then we need to think about what does it mean to be the church. And one of the things that Aaron says uh, in this lecture that I was listening to is this idea of, of the power of local communities. And he talked about the necessity to think about country, or excuse me, county over country, county over country. We may not be able to change the country back to neutral world or positive world, but we have to focus on the things that are local to us. And one of the ways in which we are going to uh, be successful, the way in which we're going to lead the church into the future, is if our primary affections are located in the places that matter, our families and our church. Because the world out there is negative world, and it will take you out. So if this was true when this was written by Kenda Creasy Dean uh, back in Neutral World, it's even more true now. The need for the creed, the need for the community, and third tool, they feel called by this story to contribute to its larger purpose. They feel called. There's a creed, there's a community, and there's a contribution. That what I do matters and has an impact. And then finally, the fourth tool that they have is hope, hope for the future, promised by the story. In addition, these youth seem to have families and churches that model convincingly that these tools matter. Something is at stake in using these cultural tools as the parents do, and something is lost in not using them at all. And so there's something to be learned here for those who are younger in the faith, young men who are here, and something to be learned uh, for those of us who have the responsibility of modeling for our kids, and not just our own kids, but the kids of this church. Your kids may be out of the house. You may have grandkids, but you still take vows. Every time we baptize a baby, that's your child. We have an opportunity. We have not just an opportunity, the responsibility to raise them up. So these are the four tools, creed, community, contribute, and hope. These are what I might call the lost tools of learning uh, in accord with what Dorothy Sayers wrote about long ago, the lo- losing the tools of learning. But to these lost tools of learning that the evangelical church has, has not captured, the Mormons have, but the evangelicals haven't, The Protestants have it. The Roman Catholics have it. Creed, community, contribution, and hope. To these lost tools of learning, I would add a fifth lost tool for successfully transmitting the faith and for successfully being who God has called us to be. And that fifth tool is masculinity. We've lost it. It's like the Entwives. We don't know where they went. Masculinity. Masculinity within the tradition. The loss of masculinity in the church has resulted in the loss of men in the church. And it has resulted in the loss of 
masculinity for the men who do find themselves in the church. Either we don't have men, or we have men here and we don't have masculinity. That's what David Morrow found as he did research and produced his book, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And he said in the introduction of his book, the system is perfectly designed to get the results that we are getting. Where are the men? They're not there. And they're not there because the system has been designed not to bring them in. And when they're in, they're not, it's not designed for us to fully express who we were called to be, who we were made to be. I want to make space. If you haven't figured this out, I want to make space for us to be men again. I've kind of, you know, I was talking about this earlier today as to what generated this um, desire to want to even do this College of Men. And really, it's kind of basic. I just got to the place where I was tired of apologizing for who I believe God has made me to be naturally. Sort of a lost sensibility of what it means to be a man. And I've had to, I've had to uh, explain it to a, to a degree that I thought was uh, becoming irrational. Like this, is, this is what it means to be a man. What you're seeing from me, I think, is just masculinity. And it's become incoherent to see masculinity to go, that, well, that doesn't, that doesn't track with all the things that I've been taught about what it means to be a man. And so I think there's a desperate need for a recovery of masculinity. David Morrow thinks the same. He says, the more I study churches, the more I come to believe the modern church, is, the modern church system is engineered to reach women. Our very definition of a, quote, good, a good Christian skews female. And to illustrate this, he invites uh, those that he goes and speaks to and churches that he consults with to take a quiz that examines two sets of values and to ask this question, which set better characterizes the values of Jesus Christ and his true disciples? Take a look at the set of values. What are the values? There's set A and there's set B. Two sets of values. Set A You tell me if you think that this best represents Jesus Christ and what it means to be a disciple, that you have competence. As a disciple, you have power. As a disciple, you you, uh, enjoy and privilege efficiency and achievement and skill and proving oneself and getting results, accomplishing things where you have objectives, you are goal-oriented, there's a certain measure of self-sufficiency, a certain measure of success or desire for success, a certain enjoyment in competition. Does that sound like Jesus? Does that sound like a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or perhaps Jesus and a disciple of Jesus Christ sounds more like this other set of values, set B, love. Communication, beauty, relationships, mutual support, helping one another, nurturing one another, the primacy of one's feelings, the necessity of sharing and relating to one another, a value for community, the necessity of loving cooperation, and space for personal expression. Now, if you were to be asked which one of these sets best describes who Jesus is and Jesus' expectation for what it means to be a disciple, uh, what would you say? Don't tell me what you want to say. Tell me what you think is normally pointed to. Is it set A? How many think set A? How many think set B? Yeah, feelings. Feelings. <laughs> yeah, you feel like it's set B. Well, Morrow says that over the years he's administered this quiz to thousands of people, men and women alike, Christians and non-Christians, and more than 90% of the time, people choose set B as the best representation of Christ and his values. Where did these set of values come from? Well, close. They come from the best-selling book, Men Are From Mars, Women are from Venus. 
Both sets. Yep. Set A is Marshall, and set B is what? V- Venal? V- Venus? Whatever it is. In chapter 2, Dr. John Gray identifies set A that represents the values common among men, while set B represents the values common among women. And so this quiz reveals the startling truth that most people, this is uh, Murrow here, most people think of Christ as having the values that come naturally to a woman. This This is the culture informing us of this. This isn't derived from the Bible. This is... This is the feedback loop of what we're telling ourselves, the the story that we're telling ourselves and reinforcing ourselves as to what it means to be a Christian. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then these are your primary values, love and communication and beauty and relationships and support and helping, nurturing, feeling, sharing, relating, community, loving, cooperation, personal expression. Now, of course, there's going to be a measure of this when it comes to being a Christian, We're not here to affirm um, barbarism, but to suggest that these are the highly prized and highly valued uh, and required values of what it means to be a follower of of Jesus Christ, it, it forms a disconnect from those who feel like they're men. It becomes incoherent. Christianity becomes incoherent. Well, yeah, I understand these, and I, I recognize these, and I see the value of them, but those aren't my primary default settings. I, I, don't, I like to see skill. I value skill, achievement. I, I like to see objectives accomplished. I don't think we should shy away from power. This is the kinds of things that men are, are thinking. Dr. Woody Davis studied this issue more fa- uh, formally, um, Murrow says, Davis conducted a series of focus groups to identify the primary themes of the Christian faith. The ten most mentioned responses all came from America's, uh, American culture's feminine set, including such themes as support, nurture, humility, so on. There's widespread agreement among the religious and the irreligious alike that genuine Christianity is, at its core, a soft, nurturing faith. Now, I'm not telling you this. This is what the research says, if you care about what research says. This is the research. Davis goes on to say, to, quote, be like Christ means always loving, always caring, always compassionate, and always gentle. Jesus does not judge people. He hugs them. That's who Jesus is. It creates a culture that looks like this. Church culture built on Venus values produces more women than men uh, who possess these values, or it attracts more women than men who possess these values. And so more women get involved in the church, which results in a surplus of women. It pushes the church towards Venus values, and that results in the church culture built on Venus values. And around and around we go. And the church becomes incoherent to men. The system is perfectly designed to get the results that you're getting. The system is designed to create a space and a place in where masculinity becomes incoherent. You you can't make sense of it. Do I belong here? Why don't I belong here? Why can't I fit in? Why am I constantly feeling the need to have to apologize for how God made me? I think it's pernicious, and we'll explain why in just a little bit. It's not healthy for the church. It's not healthy for men. This produces a cycle of femininity in the church. and The system is designed to get us where we're getting. This is part of the problem. I'm diagnosing the problem. I was uh, sharing earlier, somebody was asking me, What's this, what is this uh, college of men going to be about? Well, first I'm going to make the case. This week is making the case why we need something like a college of men and what, what it means to be a man. And then next week we're going to talk about what it means to live like a man. And then our final week together I'm going to talk to us about what it means to die like a man. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to live like a man? Godly man. 
What does it mean to die like a godly man? So I'm making the case that we've got a problem. We don't know what it means to be a man. And some of the reason why we don't know what it means to be a man is because of the spirit of egalitarianism that has made its way into the church. Now, you've heard me talk a little bit more frequently about egalitarianism here uh, in the last couple of months or so. I've had a bit of an epiphany. A light switch has gone on as I've come to see what egalitarianism, uh, egalitarianism is how it's made its way into the church, and what its long-term effects are. I was originally introduced to this term, uh, particularly uh, when I came out of Geneva College and I was uh, studying, um, uh, I was studying ministry, and I was uh, entertaining the possibility of, of becoming a youth pastor at a local church in Beaver County, and it was a PCUSA church and they wanted to know what my views were on women's ordination. And um, having been raised in a non-denominational church where that really wasn't discussed too much, and then having gone to Geneva College, which is a very uh, conservative, conservative Presbyterian school, my answer to the question was, well, we're not supposed to do that, right? That's just what I thought. And I didn't get the job. And so I went back to... Um, my, one of my college professors, Dr. Bob Frazier, uh, who taught in the philosophy department, who was also a pastor of Chippewa United Presbyterian Church at the time, PCUSA pastor. And I said, can you help me understand this? I, I was asked with this question. I wasn't really prepared for it, and uh, they seem to have that in a high value. Can you, can you share with me um, what, what's the, the biblical principles of all of this? And so he sat me down, and he gave me what is the egalitarian uh, talk from the scriptures, uh, pro- making uh, arguments as to why uh, we should allow women in ministry. And there's the reference to Deborah, and there's the reference to Galatians, where Paul says uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, so on and so forth. Uh, he was, he was uh, giving me what was the egalitarian uh, theological argument. Now, I've come to see that there are some real weaknesses in that argument. It's actually not much of a theological argument as much as it is a sociological argument because all of those biblical arguments are predicated on one sociological belief uh, that is shared by those who affirm egalitarianism, and it's this. Well, the people of the Bible, they didn't know any better. You know, Paul was a man of his day. Paul was a, a man of his culture. Had he lived long enough and had enough time to allow the Holy Spirit to kind of work on him, he would have seen that, oh, yes, of course, uh, his theology would have, would have developed in such a way as to be more explicit in this view. We can see it kind of in a latent form, but if he had just kind of grown up like the rest of us, he would have rejected all that old thinking and he would have made room for that. That's a sociological position. That's not a theological argument. It's an evolutionary argument. It's a view of how society develops. We're just every day getting a little bit better and a little bit better. Progress. So I think that there are some real challenges uh, to that theological position as I've come to study it more and more. And the EPC uh, position is kind of to punt on it and to say, well, people of good faith disagree on this, and so uh, we'll allow local churches to make that decision. Churches can do that. Presbyteries can make their decision. But as far as the denomination is concerned, it's, it's really up to you guys to figure out. So really, I, I'm, I'm grateful in many ways to be in the EPC because I can be in a position where I can disagree and say, well, I understand your position and this can be my position, and, and I don't have to justify it beyond the point of saying, well, People of good faith have different, differing uh, views on this. Now, I didn't want to bring up egalitarianism to talk uh, exclusively about women's ordination. That's usually where it comes in at the church level. When you bring the word egalitarianism into the conversation, that's where many go and start thinking. And that is an important part of it. But egalitarianism is much, much bigger, so much bigger than just women's ordination. And I will suggest to you that it's actually far more pernicious than we might realize. 
because it, uh, it has to do not just with uh, women's ordination, but it has to do with our understanding of, of order. It has to do with our understanding of the political dimensions of the world, the way in which God has ordered all things. And it has to do with uh, a philosophical perspective that I believe has become corrupt from the evil one. Now, I'm going to make an appeal to authority here. Uh, This isn't just my observation. I'm learning from and have learned from one of the great um, uh, leaders, one of the great uh, thinkers of the faith, and that is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis has something to say about egalitarianism, but he doesn't use the word egalitarianism. He uses the word democracy. Democracy. Egalitarianism is a corrupt form of the spirit of democracy, and it's corrupted primarily by envy. Democracy corrupted by envy equals egalitarianism. Everybody got that? Democracy corrupted by envy produces egalitarianism. So what in the world is egalitarianism? Well, let's listen to Lewis for just a minute, and then we'll talk about it. Lewis writes in the Screwtape Letters in that section uh, entitled, Screwtape Proposes a Toast, which is at the back of the book. He has this to say about democracy. Let me read to you just a a few short paragraphs. Democracy, according to Lewis, and of course this is Screwtape speaking, he's a devil, he's a demon, and they've thrown a party for him, and, and he has an opportunity to say a few words, and, and he's, he takes that opportunity to rally the troops, all the other lower demons that are there for the party, to encourage them in their wicked, uh, wickedness and in their corruption of, of men and women. And uh, so Screwtape takes the opportunity to educate, and he, he wants to talk a little bit about democracy. And he says, democracy is the word with which you must lead them by the nose. Just, just listen to that sentence. It's a hook because we think democracy is good. And in many ways it is. I'm not suggesting we should be totalitarians. I don't want anything to do with that. I also don't want to be a, uh, a uh, uh, libertine either, a, a libertarian. I'm not really interested in libertarianism. There is something about democracy is, that's good, but it gets corrupted by envy. And once it's corrupted by envy, it gets hooks, and you can lead them by the nose because everybody's got a fairly positive view of democracy. Democracy is the word with which you must lead them by the nose. You can use the word democracy... To sanction in his thought, the the thoughts of men and women, the most degrading and also the least enjoyable of all human feelings. You can get him to practice, not only without shame, but with a positive glow of self-approval, conduct which, if undefended by the magic word, would be universally derided. What is he saying? With the word democracy, you can get men to commit sins that they would never think of committing. Democracy corrupted by envy, egalitarianism, becomes a a, a subtle doorway, a, a, a smooth, what does Lewis say about the road to hell? It's, it's smooth without any sharp turns. It's soft underfoot. It doesn't jostle you. You just merrily go on your way. Democracy becomes soft. Democracy becomes something that is inserted in your nose and you don't even think about it. You think, oh, that's nice jewelry. Everybody's wearing it. And you get led by the nose. Lewis goes on to write, under the influence of this incantation, the incantation of democracy, those who are in any or every way inferior can labor more wholeheartedly and successfully than ever before to pull down everyone else to their own level. Actually, we're getting to totalitarianism. This is what egalitarianism leads to. Oh, we're all equal. But I'm just a little bit more equal than you. No, you're not. You're down here with me. 
I'm going to make sure you're down here with me. I'm going to make sure that everybody is the same. Everybody's equal. Under the influence of this incantation, those who are in any or every way inferior can labor more wholeheartedly and successfully to pull down everyone else to their own level. It is the means by which we go to the lowest common denominator. It is a race to the bottom. But that is a mere byproduct. What I want to fix your attention on is the vast overall movement toward the discrediting and finally the elimination of every kind of human excellence. And let me tell you, being a man, masculinity is a human excellence. It's a gift given to us by God. God has called us to be excellent men. And... This democracy, this spirit of democracy, is a means by which of, uh, to eliminate this human excellence, to eliminate masculinity, to eliminate every kind of human excellence, moral, cultural, social, or intellectual. And it's not pretty to notice how democracy, in this incant- uh, incantatory sense, this spirit of democracy, this egalitarian democracy, this totalitarian democracy where everybody is pulled down to the equal level, is now doing for us the work that was once done by the most ancient dictators and by the same methods. You remember how one of the Greek dictators, they called them tyrants then, sent an envoy to another dictator to ask his advice about the principles of government. The second dictator led the envoy into a field of corn, and there he snicked off with his cane the top of every stalk that rose an inch or so above the general level. So the dictator's walking through the field of grain, and not all the grain is growing at the same height. Some are excelling. Some are not quite as tall. Well, the dictator wants sameness, democracy, egalitarianism. One stock can easily be replaced with the other. And so he goes through with his, his cane. He just goes, boop, boop, get down, get down there, boop. It's all the same, boop. Well, we will have no excellence. We will have no distinction We will have nobody look different or act different or be different from somebody else. There's no such thing as as excellence and distinction. The moral was plain. This is screw tape going on to explain what he's saying. The moral was plain. Allow no preeminence among your subjects. No excellence. Nobody different. Nobody better. Allow no preeminence among your subjects. Let no man live who is wiser or better or more famous or even handsomer than the mass. Cut them all down to a level, all slaves, all ciphers, all nobodies, all equals. Thus, tyrants could practice, in a sense, democracy. But now, democracy can do the same work without any other tyrant than her own, democracy becomes the dictator as it is encapsulated in the culture and it becomes the spirit of the age. And we say, no, no, you can't be different. Everything has to be the same. Boys can be girls and girls can be boys. We're not going to have binaries. We're going to have fluid, gender fluidity and we're going to go wherever we want and and uh, as, as I've shared this with you before, I hated this song. I hated it. It's like I can feel the, 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 the emotion coming out of me. When my kids, as, as they were little children, I don't know what we were doing. We let them watch Blue's Clues. Anybody watch Blue's Clues? Yeah, you guys, you grew up on Blue's Clues, didn't you? Sing the song. Go ahead. <laughs> At the end, what's he sing? Remember Nathan? You can do anything that you want to do. You can be anything that you want to be. Don't give up. You can just, whatever. There's no distinctions. We've, we've, we had an entire generation of kids who were listening to that, and now we've got, we've got gender confusion blowing up all over the place. It's the spirit of egalitarianism. Democracy 
infected by envy that says, I don't like it that you can be like this and I can't be, and so I want to be this way. I don't like it that men are pastors and there aren't women. I want to be a pastor. Well, democracy says you can. I don't like it that you get to work in this area and I don't. We need to have certain quotas established so that we have uh, certain genders and certain races and certain whatever that are represented in the workplace or in the government or whatever. Because it's all got to be the same. Forget excellence. I want to be a member of the PSO. Do you play anything? No. What does that matter? I've had some conversations with Chad about how even this is encroaching its way into the PSO. If ever there was a, an institution, an organization that was predicated on excellence, you've got to have some skill. You've got to know what you're doing. In which skill was set aside and a desire for egalitarianism. That's, I was surprised to hear that. But it happens even there. It's happening in institutions of higher learning. It's happening in the church. It's happening in your workplace, and it's happening in the culture. We don't want men anymore. That's just a category that's too rigid. You can't be a man. You have to be something else. You've got to be some indistinguishable, non-binary, hybrid something or other, puddle of, puddle of goo. I don't want anything to do with that. And I hope you don't either. Because it's not right, and it's not biblical. All equals, all nobodies. Thus tyrants could practice, in a sense, democracy, but now democracy can do the same work without any other tyrant than her own. No one need go through the field with a cane. The little stalks will now of themselves bite the tops off the big ones. The big ones are beginning to bite off their own in a desire to be like other stocks. Bite off the heads of the other, the one who's getting a little too high, and then if you start to get a little too high, oh, I better bite my own head off. That's egalitarianism. That's the spirit of egalitarianism. And it's got problems. It creates problems left, right, and center all over the place. But I'm sharing with you that it creates, uh, one of the problems that it creates, this spirit of democracy, is a loss of the category and the consciousness, the consciousness of men. Of what it means to be a man. And I don't want to feel that way anymore. And I don't want you to feel that anymore, way anymore. I want you to thrive as men. I want you to be who God made you to be and not to have to apologize for it. No apologies. Why civilization depends on the strength of men. I shared that with you earlier this morning. If you were here at the worship service, this quote from Anthony Eslin, there is no city without the brotherhood. There would be his thesis Think of this for one second. There would be no West and no Western civilization if it wasn't for men who were bonded together in the bonds of love and leadership and hierarchy and fraternity. You wouldn't have music. You wouldn't have literature. You wouldn't have agriculture. You wouldn't have uh, any kind of cultural development if it wasn't for men. Men who risk their lives to get up high and to face the elements, and to build things. And we're losing a sense of that. There's no city without the brotherhood. And the church is the city of God. And there is no church. There's no church without the brotherhood. There's no church worth its salt, at least it seems to me. And I say that specifically. No church worth its salt. Because salt is a powerful thing. If you've ever watched what it does to the underneath of your truck over the years, you know that's got some power. It's called to be active and to do some things in the world. And if we don't have men who are endowed with power, being men, we're not going to get anything done. And God is not going to be glorified. I'm making the case for you. 
I'm making the case as to why this is important. I'm making the case for you as to why I'm so passionate about this. I'm passionate about it because I'm tired of apologizing for it, but I'm making the case for it because my heart is going out to men. I see you trying to to figure it out. How am I supposed to behave? And if ever there was a place where you were allowed to behave like a man, it should be the church. It should be the first place where you're allowed to be a man where you're encouraged to be a man, where you're nurtured to be a man, where you're celebrated because you are a man made in the image of God. It should be the first place where it's affirmed. Increasingly, it's the last place. So I want to see you guys released. I want to see your power. I want to see your strength. I want to see your your abilities and your ambition and your giftings and your glory that's endowed upon you by your creator as a man to shine in this place for the glory of God and for the sake of the world. Because they're dying out there too. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what it means to be made in the image of God. They don't understand what it means to be a man. No apologies. There is no city without the brotherhood. And there is no hope without the church. And there's no church without men. So what does it mean to be a man? What does biblical manhood look like? Well, I want to suggest to you that you and I all of us, we should be prone to be men. Prone to be men. And this kind of came together accidentally, this acronym PRONE. In fact, it's, it's not quite in the, the order that I would have uh, originally uh, put it in, but if I rearranged the letters, I got PRONE. So I thought, all right, I'll do it that way. But there's something here and something that you can remember. What it means to be a man. To be a man is defined for us by the Word of God. I'm expecting that you're all going to bring your Bibles. Is that what we did? No, we we did not. (laughs) Well, grab a pew Bible. If you don't have a pew Bible, there's more pews with Bibles in them. All right, young men, go to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 5. Verse 5, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. No man. There is no city without the brotherhood. There is no world without men. There was no man to work the ground, and mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden of Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in the sight and, uh, pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is uh, Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of uh, Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of the land is good. Oh, look at all these words. Dillium. Dillium? Bedillium. And onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gives names. Uh, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast on the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Here you find... God's description, God's um, declaration of a biblical anthropology. What does it mean to be human and a biblical masculinity? What does it mean to be a man? Well, let's go through this. Five things that I think that we can derive out of Genesis chapter 2. And I will share with you that I'm also uh, assuming that out of chapter 2, there's a few things that we will have learned and read from Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the first thing is that what it means to be a man is to have power. To be made by God as a man is to have power. You have power. Real power. God has given you dominion. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26... When God made, in the first telling of a creation story, God gives dominion to humanity and to men. You have dominion over the earth. But you also have what is known as philosophically as agency. You can do things. And God wants you to do things. And God expects you to do things. If you don't do the things, you don't fulfill your mandate of what it means to be a man. Power. I remember as a kid when my dad was uh, working, he was in construction. And as a small kid, thinking how amazing it was to, to see the strength of his hands. I don't look much like my dad. He's got a beard. Some of you have uh, seen him. Um, I, I take... Actually, I take a little bit more after my mother, if you've ever met my mother. But one of the things that my dad and I share is we have the same hands. When I look at my hands, I see his hands. And I remember his hands always being strong, strong hands. Like a, he, had a, he had a vice grip for, for hands from all those years of grabbing hammers and all those years of picking up ladders and all those years of doing things with his hands. He had agency. He had strength. And I admired it. I thought, yeah, I, I, I want to do those things too. I want to grow up to be a man. And I want to use my hands, and I want to use the strength, and I want to use the gifts that God has given to me and the power that he has given to me to affect change in the world, to build things in the world. I remember when I was a young buck, and I was uh, working in construction with an older gentleman, and we had to bring up a bunch of two-by-sixes. I may have told you this story before. Down at the bottom of the, of the work site, and the house was set back and up a little bit of a hill, and we had to... We had to Carry all the two by sixes up. Two by six by 12. Two by six by 12. And you start with two. I remember going up with two, two by six by 12s, and Paul was his name. And I was, I'd gone up, and so I was coming back empty handed, and he was kind of coming up, and he had three. So guess what? I grabbed four. And I took four with me. And he was probably in his 50s at the time, but. He saw that I had four, so he grabbed six, or excuse me, five. And then I grabbed six, and it was over my head, and I was going like this. 
and we were laughing and we were, it was hysterical and it was a lot of fun. But we just wanted to, we wanted to express our power. It's something in the nature of a man to want to do that, to, to, to show strength. I have, I have a son, he's here, you dads who have sons, they, all they want to do when you're little is wrestle you. And that's great. I, we used to have a game, what did we call it, where you would just try to get me off the couch. I, we had, I would lay on the couch, and the, and, the, and the whole point of the game was for Nathan and his sister Hannah to get me off the couch. And I would, they would, uh, 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 and I'd, you know, every once in a while I'd throw them over across the room, and we'd just have a lot of fun. And Nathan would just, he would attack. I remember getting phone calls from my wife, Holly, saying, you have to come home. He's attacking me. He just needed to wrestle. And we had a, we had a um, trampoline in the backyard, and I'd get in the trampoline, I'd just lay there, and they'd just jump on me. Nathan would just, ah! That's natural. Because God has given us power. Power to build. Power to keep. Power to cultivate. Verse 15, what does it say? The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. He's given us power to do work, power to cultivate, power to, to, to care, power in your hands. Don't worry about superheroes. Don't worry about Marvel. Marvel stinks now. If you're, looking, you're not going to find a good superhero anymore in Marvel or in the DC universe. Don't worry about it. Look at your own hands. You have power. God has given you power. Wonderful, amazing power. Power to name, verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Within rabbinic uh, tradition, not only did Adam name the beast, but there was a sense, the rabbis suggested that there was sort of a co-formation that happened as Adam conferred a name upon them. What is this thing? It's an elephant, and it began to take elephant-like qualities because there's something in the power of names. That's why all three of my kids have consequential names. I knew that God had given me power to name them. And I wanted them to have names that, that inform their lives. Hannah, named after a woman of great faith. Nathan, Named after a man who had power and who spoke truth to power when King David was running around acting unmanly. I want my son to grow up with that identity. Abigail, the woman who was shrewd and used her words wisely. We're still praying that she comes into her name. (laughs) And if you don't have kids, you still have power in names. Because you engage with people. And you have the power to bless. You have the power to curse. You have the power to build worlds. I've, I've talked to you about the, the world-building power of words. Words build worlds. You have power. To be a man is to be prone. Power. Power. Second, responsibility. Verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. To be a man is to bear responsibility. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about the glad assumption of godly responsibility. It's a key feature of manhood. The glad assumption of godly responsibility. To be a man is to be heavy laden with the glory of responsibility that God has bestowed upon you as a man. And not only has he given you the responsibility, but he's given you the power to keep it. To carry it. And if not on your own strength, the power to at least say, God, I need your help. Make my legs strong. Give strength to my arms. Like Samson there tied up against those columns who said, One more time, Lord, give me the strength. 
Because God has laid upon you responsibility, a responsibility first and foremost to obedience to Almighty God. To be a man is to be, a, is to be someone who is under authority and in obedience, submissive obedience to the one who is your greater. And we all stand, this is the only time in which democracy is true, because all of us stand as inferiors to the king. And we owe him our lives. And we owe him our allegiance. We owe him our obedience. We have a responsibility to obedience to God. We have a responsibility to work the ground, as I already indicated in verse 5. To work the ground for the sake of creation. God didn't cause it to rain upon the earth because there was no man to work it. And if we don't work the ground, if we don't cultivate what God has called us to, we will not see the glory that God has bestowed upon this world to come into fruition. The world is heavy laden with possibility. What are we going to do? What, what's our responsibility? We have a responsibility to educate our wife, to educate those who God has put under our charge. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There's a whole history of things that happened before Eve even came. Hey, before you got here, God made me and he, he told me uh, to name all these animals. And he gave me some instruction about these trees over here. Let me explain to you what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. A responsibility to educate those who are under our charge, under our care, for whom we are to exercise power. Responsibility that is local, local to the garden before the world. There is a hierarchy here and a priority. Adam's first responsibility was to the garden, and through his submission and his obedience and the exercise of his power in that garden, later on would the world be blessed. We have sometimes a confused understanding of what it, be, it means to be a man. Let me go out and get the world. Remember uh, Chris Farley? Remember in his motivational speech? I'm going to... I'm going to get the world by its tail. Go ahead, Andy. Say it. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> get the world by its tail and pull it down and stick it in my pocket. The world is your oyster. Go out and conquer the world. It's one of the places where I really agree with Jordan Peterson. Don't worry about conquering the world. Just make your bed. Let's start there. You have a responsibility to the thing that is closest to you. A responsibility to your family. A responsibility to your church. A responsibility to your community. County over country. That's the responsibility. And then you have a responsibility of mission to the world. Prone. i got to move us along. I see we're getting a little bit late, but let me move us along. Oh, office. Being made in the image of God confers an office. An office is conferred through that image. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. We have been made in the image of God, and having been made in the image of God, we are given an office. That is to say, a commission. You ever, if you know anybody in the military, when they get a promotion, they call it a what? A commission. And with that commission comes authority and responsibility to do certain things. When you're a private, you do certain things. When you're a sergeant, you do different things. When you're a lieutenant, you do even different things. When you're the general, you do things that are different still. When you have a commission, when you have an office, it comes with authority and responsibility. And, uh, but pr primarily, I want to talk about authority. Office assumes hierarchy and creates authority. There's God above you. He's the general, he's the king, and he says, I'm going to make you a lieutenant, and with that lieutenant um, commission, you have authority. Your office confers authority upon you. 
You have offices uh, perhaps even in your places of work. If you are a boss where you work, that's an office. That's not something that's created by whatever industry you work in or whatever company you work in. That's something that God created. Authority and authority structures. And to be a man is to occupy an office, and with that office comes authority. So use it. Men are under God and over other things. That's called headship. It's a lost understanding and a lost value in the church. To be a man is to be under God and over things. What things? If you're married, it's your wife. If you have kids, it's your children. If you have an office in the church, it's you have responsibility over those in the church. And it's not inappropriate to exercise your authority. Don't buy into the egalitarianism. Now, don't be a barbarian. Don't abuse your authority. There's always, anytime you talk about authority, there's, we're always quick and we should be cautious that we don't abuse our authority. But because abuses of authority occur doesn't mean that authority isn't real or necessary. You have to have authority. Let me give you an example of why you have to have an authority. Say we're going to have dinner together. And um, I ask you, well, what, what, do you, what would you like whenever you come over? And you say, well, I don't, it's fine, whatever you want. Well, we, could have, we can have uh, porterhouse steaks or we can have uh, crab legs. What would you like? Well, they both sound good. What would you like? Somebody has to make a choice. Are we having porterhouse or are we having crab legs? There's all kinds of good things here, and it's not, it's not immediately obvious what we should do. And so God confers authority upon people to make those kinds of decisions. What should we do? We should do this. And then that gives us an opportunity to say, ah, we should have really done the other thing. There are competing good things, and it's not immediately obvious as to what we should do. The world is filled with that. And so how do we discern? We discern because God gives us the gift of authority. And we use it properly for the sake of those for whom we're serving. I'm going to get us some porterhouse steaks because I know you like steaks. I love you and I want us to eat this together. I want you to have a great night. I want to serve you and so let me make this decision. Office. After office, there's nature. Manhood is a part of the natural order of things. Verse 7. What does it say? Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed it into his nostrils, the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. It's not a social construct. It's a part of what God made. And we can deny it, and we can deny it, and we can deny it. And it's like taking a rubber band or, or something elastic and pulling on it and pulling on it and pulling on it and pulling on it. And guess what? It's going to snap back. What's that line in Jurassic Park, Bob, we like to say? Uh, what, what's the guy's name, the tall guy? Nature will find a way. Will find a way. That's right. Who said that? Who was that guy? Jeff Goldblum, right? Uh, nature uh, finds a way. Nature will snap back. We can deny created realities all that we want. We can deny masculinity. We can deny it in the church. We can deny it in the world. We can deny it in the doctor's offices and pretend like boys can be girls and girls can be boys. But let me tell you, when we're done running this ridiculous and immoral experiment as a culture, we're going to find out we're on the wrong side of the decision because nature's going to come back. Because to be a man is to be a part of the natural created order that God has made. And we turn our backs to it at our own demise. We should not deny it. We have to learn how to take it up responsibly and to be what God has called us to be. Nature. It's part of the created order. 
The nature of manhood has its own integrity. It can't be something else than what it is. You can't just swap out parts. There is no such thing as egalitarianism. Manhood cannot and should not be scrubbed from the creation or society. We do that at our own peril. Finally, ecstasy. An essential part of manhood is joy and desire. Adam rejoiced over Eve. Again, verse 23. This at last is bone of my bone, the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Adam rejoiced. He celebrated. And his desire was for his wife. What it means to be a man is to be someone who's ready and capable of celebration and to pursue good things, ecstasy, to enter into the the full joy of, of that which is rightly desired and to celebrate it and to bring others into the celebration of it. As a man, we'll find that there are certain things we need to deny, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not interested in talking about denial anymore, or at least not for a little while. And the reason I'm not interested in talking about denial is because so much of our culture wants to deny everything, wants to deny even the fact of what it means to be a man. And yes, as a man, as I said, there's certain things we should deny. Once you get married, that's it. That's your wife. You deny all others. And so there's an appropriate responsibility upon us to deny certain things. But I want us to regain a conception of what it means to be men who celebrate and rejoice and sing loud and, and, and eat together and toast to one another and love one another and encourage one another and nurture and build one another up and strengthen in the bonds of love for each other and for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the world is desperately dour because men don't sing. Men don't celebrate as men. The world is suffering because of that. Let's be prone to men and masculinity. Finally, last thing I want to share with you. Why is masculinity important and under attack? If men are not men according to God's design, then the world becomes disordered. God has created the world in such a way to be a certain thing and to, and to run in a certain way. And if we deny what it means to be a man, the world becomes terribly disordered. It's like trying to drive a car and one of your tires is loose and it's just wobbling around just doesn't go the world not only becomes disordered it's not no longer functioning according to the design because of sin men are not men the world becomes incoherent you can't make sense of the world we're desperately trying to make sense of the world without these categories and you know what's happening men are dying at an unprecedented rate due to opioids you heard about the opioid crisis? Why do you think that's happening? Did you know that testosterone rates in men are plummeting in our culture? Did you know that? Nobody knows why. It's happening because things are disordered. It's happening because things are incoherent. We don't understand what it means to be men, and we can't make sense of the world If men are not men according to God's design, then the world becomes vulnerable. It becomes disordered, it becomes incoherent, and it becomes vulnerable because there is no strength in the world to protect the weak and to protect the innocent and to affirm the good. This all sounds pretty pernicious. This all sounds pretty diabolical. This all sounds pretty evil. We'll get to that in just a second. If men are not men according to God's design, then the world becomes a place where there's no hope. There's no hope. Because the world can't be what it's supposed to be. This church can't be what it's supposed to be 
if you are not men. I want this place to be filled with hope. You watch the news as I do. Are you concerned about the future? Are you concerned for your kids? We all have a measure of concern. And I'm not saying that we can eliminate those concerns. Those are real concerns. But what I do want to say is let's not lack for hope. Sure, there's going to be concerns, and those concerns are going to press themselves no matter what. But we have something to do with the hope. Let's create some hope. Let's establish some hope. Let's create a community, a church, and a larger community, a a place here in Pittsburgh where there's some real hope where people can see it and feel it, where our kids can enter into it and say, you know what, I think there is something out there worth living for. I think there is some place that my life is going. I think I am ready to step out and to step up. Let's be men. Let's create hope. The fight against manhood is not primarily cultural, it's not primarily social, it's not primarily political, it's not primarily psychological, it is spiritual. The devil wants nothing to do with manhood. I'll explain it to you. If you still have your Bibles, go to Genesis 3, verse 15. The threat against masculinity in men is satanic. <clears throat> what does Genesis 3.15 say? Because you have done this, uh, this is verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust shall, uh, you shall eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he, male, masculine, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We are in mortal combat because we're men. We have an enemy. And that mortal combat has played itself out throughout the scriptures and plays itself out even to this day. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Don't bother looking it up. Let me just read it for you. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sapphira and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son... If it is a man, if it is a male child, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Where'd that come from? Enmity. Evil. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Male children. Death. Evil. Enemy. Now lest you think like I did that, well, okay, now that Jesus has been safely born, safely uh, made his way to Calvary, died, he rose again, and he's ascended. Well, perhaps the fight is over. Wrong. Wrong. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. The, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood. Your brothers who are being sought after. who are being put to death, who are at war with that devil who prowls like a lion. 
Toxic masculinity is just the latest satanic assault against men and biblical masculinity. It's just the latest assault. It, it still kills. It still removes men from the scene. It's still satanic. It's not right. And I care about you guys. And I want you to be men. I want you to be who God has called you to be. Don't be ashamed of being a man. Don't ever be ashamed of being a man. It's God's purpose for you. It's glory conferred upon you. Live it out. Be it. Be fully who God called you and made you to be. Be the man of God that he wants you to be. God loves men. God loves you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be men. You made us to be like men. You want us to rise up and be a man. Help us, Lord, to be those kinds of men, to be the men of God that you want us to be in order that you and your glory might be seen in us and in the world. Help us, Lord, as we do battle with the evil one, as we fight with the power that you have given us to fight. And even in our weakness, Lord, we are made strong because you lend to us your power, the power of the new Adam, the power of the man who came, lived, and died, and rose, and confers power upon mankind through the Spirit. Help us, Lord, not to shirk from our responsibilities or to be ashamed. Help us not to apologize. Help us to learn what it means to to love you with all our heart, to love those who you've put under our charge and in our care. Above all, Lord, help us to glorify your Son, who is the man. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We thought we'd sing one more song together. Which one are we doing? 296. Pull out your Trinity hymnal. We're singing about power. One through four. One, five, and six. Let's do it. Should we go a cappella on six? Let's do it.